En Gugui diu que hi ha tres grans literatures africanes. Una literatura que ens és de difícil accés a tots nosaltres perquè és la que s'anomena la oratura, la literatura oral africana en les llengües africanes i que és ben viva en tot el continent i que és el sòcol de tot el que es pot escriure, tota la literatura que neix de l'Àfrica. Després hi ha la literatura d'aquells autors que han escollit, han decidit escriure en les llengües colonials. I finalment hi ha la tercera, la seva literatura, que és la d'aquells autors que en un moment han decidit escriure en les pròpies llengües africanes, desenvolupar les literatures nacionals africanes. Gugi Bationgo, i per cert vull felicitar l'editor perquè en la com a reflex del que és aquesta tercera escola dels escriptors que escriuen en llengües africanes, ha posat a la portada de desplaçar al centre aquest mapamundi amb Àfrica al centre, perquè es tracta de tornar al centre a cadascuna de les cultures i de les literatures africanes. El... Gugi és un autor de prestigi internacional, és un autor que és llegit de manera habitual a les universitats d'arreu del món i per tots els autors, s'ha convertit en un veritable autor universal, llibres seus com No ploris nen, El riu d'entremig, Pètals de sang, en castellà tenim El diablo en la cruz, que està traduït, i també el gra de blat. Tenim aquests somnis en temps de guerra, que és el seu diari d'infantesa, un molt emocionant diari de tots els anys de la seva infantesa fins que entra a l'escola secundària, que continua després amb un altre llibre important, que és A casa de l'intèrpret, que és la segona part d'aquest d'aquestes memòries de Gugi Wationgo. Gugi ha escrit molt assaig, ha escrit teatre. De fet, va ser una obra de teatre, una obra de teatre titulada Em casarem qui vulgui, que ha escrit amb un altre, amb un amic seu, i representada en llengua kikuyu, en un centre juvenil, és la que va crear un tal debat social que la policia el va crear el va detenir, el va empresonar sense judici, hi va haver una campanya internacional que va ser llarga per aconseguir treure'l de la presó amb Amnistia Internacional, amb el Pen Internacional fent campanya per ell i va ser en aquell moment en què en Gugi Wationgo decideix de manera definitiva escriure, fins a aquell moment havia escrit en anglès a part del teatre que havia fet en Kikuyu, escriure en Kikuyu com a llengua literària de les seves obres. La seva vida està pleta d'anècdotes, l'opció per la seva pròpia llengua el va portar a la presó i després a l'exili, però hi ha casos veritablement surrealistes de com aquesta frontera entre realitat i ficció s'esborra en el seu context per exemple, quan va publicar la novel·la Matigari, en temps del dictador Arab Moy, un del personatge principal, un revolucionari amb discursos molt abrandats, va fer que sortís l'ordre d'arrest al personatge. O sigui, la policia va intentar arrestar el personatge protagonista de la novel·la, que evidentment no podia ser arrestat, perquè és una de les virtuts que tenen els personatges de ficció, no se'ls pot trobar fàcilment per ficar-los a la presó, i això va fer que la policia tragués el llibre a totes les llibreries del país. Però Gugi Wationgo és un referent essencial també per aquest llibre, per descolonitzar la ment, aquest llibre que és un llibre profètic, un llibre que a cada any que passa va trobant nous lectors i va obrint terreny i jo he estat testimoni de debats en diversos països africans on aquest llibre és el referent que impulsa l'opció de tants escriptors africans a escriure en les seves pròpies llengües, malgrat totes les dificultats que anirem explorant en la conversa d'aquest vespre. És veritablement emocionant per mi tenir Descolonitzar la ment, que és un llibre que em va marcar quan el vaig llegir fa molts anys, finalment en llengua catalana i sabent que aquí, en aquest país, també trobarà lectors que es deixaran afectar, es deixaran canviar pel passament d'en Gugi Wationgo. Per tant, donem-li la paraula a en Gugi Wationgo. Estem molt contents 
que tornis a ser a Barcelona amb nosaltres i estem amb un gran desig de sentir allò que ens vols dir. Sí, gràcies. I was going to... You can hear me? Yes, oh. yes, yes, I hear you. Yeah. I was going to speak from the podium. Maybe you don't need but, uh, the... Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm a bit disappointed. I thought <laughs> my voice was so powerful. <laughs> now, no, no, just one now, more. I'm reduced. <laughs> uh, I was going to... Give my talk standing, I like moving around. Yes, but I have such strong jet lag mm -hmm. that I dare not. <laughs> <laughs> so you can stay here. So if you see me dozing a little bit, it just a jet it comes in waves so strong. Yeah. Like something possesses you. But it'll you know, but it'll I'll get over it. Yeah, in a minute. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Uh, no, thank you very much for your words and uh, the words of the president. Um, it's not the first time we are meeting, we have met before. Um, he is now the president of International Pen, and um, so it's so wonderful <laughs> to see you again. And he's doing so much work for enabling uh, conversation among languages, big and small, uh, marginalizing and marginalized, uh, marginalized to marginalized, marginalized to mar marginalizing. This co conversation which is so very, very important. Mm -hmm. So thank you for the work you are doing. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm going to read from my <laughs> the written script. Uh, because with jet lag, I don't <laughs> so speak about one thing and then you find myself talking about something totally different, okay? <laughs> uh, like in a dream. So I'll stick to the script very, very, I'll be very strict and stick to the script. Um, uh, I'm really going to talk about a bit about empires and colonies of the mind. You know, but really, I'm talking about language, literature, and empowerment. Uh, I want to start by congratulating Penn Katala for a century of continuous activity in support of democratic space for writers, writing, and thought. You have welcomed and given shelter to many a writer fleeing from fleeing persecution, among them being the late Chenjerai Hove from Zimbabwe, Africa. I thank you for that and for inviting me to be part of the celebrations to mark that century of your being. My own association with Penn in general goes all the way back to I don't know how many of you are born, but still. <laughs> All the way back to 1966, when I attended the International Pen Conference or Congress, then headed by Ada Miller, and which attracted literally luminaries on both sides of the Cold War. I was a young writer two novels, We've No Child and The River Between, to my credit. And although I was dubbed one of three regional guests of honor from Africa, my intention was to sit back and enjoy the literary company, which included, among notable others, Pablo Neruda of Chile. I would have gotten away with it being sort of invisible, except that during a plenary 
presentation by Ignazio Sloan, the writer of Bread and Wine, who, after complaining about the scarcity of translations of Italian writing into English, added this. And you know, Italian is not one of these Bantu languages with one or two words in the vocabulary. You know, now you can see my problem. <laughs> I was representing Africa. I couldn't hide. So I stood up after his speech and contested his claim strongly, which forced other Miller to warn the conference as a whole that while people could sing praises to the virtues of their own languages, they should not disparage other people's languages. This moment in New York reawakened my thinking on African languages and their relationship to Europe. It even made me question why I was writing my third novel, A Grain of Wheat, in English. I was then, actually, a postgraduate student in Leeds, and on my in Leeds in England, and on my return, but on my return to Kenya in 1968, I eventually found myself engaged in writing a play in my language. That was many years after I returned to Kenya. The play, Gahika Deda, or I'll marry when I want, was later banned in 1977. It also landed me in a maximum security prison for one year from December 1977 to December 1978. That was also when I decided to abandon English and embrace Ikoyo, the language with, which had been the basis of my incarceration. I wrote it on toilet paper. When on December 12, 1978, I left prison, it was with a manuscript of the first modern novel in Ikoyo, Shaitan Mudaravaine, uh, in English, Devil on the Cross. And as I said, I had written it on toilet paper. I know some of you might be surprised about this, because, you're, but, but because I know what you are thinking, that the ones you use are soft, soft. But the prison paper was a bit hard. <laughs> I, I think it, it was meant to punish prisoners, I think. But was, what, that which was not so good for the body was actually quite good as writing material. <laughs> it was then, after re my release, that I came to know that Penn was very active among the forces that fought for my release. Later, in 1982, I was forced into exile, based mainly in London, before eventually relocating to the USA. And it was from the University of California, Irvine, where I still teach, that in 1996, I got and quickly accepted a pen invitation to, you can guess where, Barcelona where I would join others in signing the Universal Declaration of Linguistic Rights, also known as the Barcelona Declaration. Everything in the 1996 Barcelona Declaration was music to my ears. For even in exile that began in 1982, I never gave up on African languages. Though exile was in an English language environment, I continued writing in Ikoyo 
and more continued thinking about the, an equal power relationship between languages. In fact, I know what he was referring to, Matigari was written in, was written in London, but published in Kenya. It's called Matigari. And in those days in Kenya, rumor and asking questions was virtually banned. And that's why when the president had, there was a character, there was a man called Matigari asking questions. Moreover, questions about truth and justice, he ordered his uh, arrest. And you are told the consequences. Uh, and that's why everything in that declaration had this kind of music to my ears. So tonight, I just want to confine myself to what I have come to learn in my struggles with language rights for my Ikoyo and for African languages. I will begin with the 1984 lectures that I gave at the University of Auckland, New Zealand, under the title, The Politics of Language in African Literature, later published under the title, Decolonizing the Mind. At the end of the lectures, a Maori woman met me outside and offered me a good, you know, very nice well of shape, with some drawings on it. I, I want you to know, she told me, that you were not talking about Kenya, but us, the Maori people. She did not elaborate. The interesting thing is that 30 years after the scene with the Maori woman, I would undergo an almost identical encounter at a Sami language college in northern Norway. Sami people, as you know, inhabit parts of Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Russia. And this time, again, my talk really was on decolonization and my own experience in Kenya. After my presentation, an elder approached me. He was very curious. He said, how? How do you know so much about us, the some people? He asked. The fact was, I did not know very much. I just talked about my own experience in Kenya. So, what were the particulars in my lectures that made these two, one Pacific and the other European, see my experience in colonial Kenya of 1908 to 1963 as equally applicable to the Maori and Sami experiences. Uh, the 2015 testimony I came across recently of one Dover Samuels a Maori politician to the Waitangi Commission about his experience of school in that era tells part of the reason. He says to the commission, caught speaking Maori, he said, and I will quote him, you'd be hurled out in front of the rest of the class and told to bend over. The teacher would have, he see here this container, which had a number of vines of apple jack out of the bush, not far from the school. So you'd bend over and he would stand back and give you what they called it, what they called it then, six of the best. On many occasions, not only did it leave bruises behind on my thighs, but drew blood. What he's talking about is violence against his own language. 
The Sami people in Norway went through a similar experience in a period between 1870 and 1970, what they call the brutal years. And this was in an attempt to turn them into fluent Norwegian speakers. Though that was now in the past, for now, Norway supports Sami language. But the memory of it must have been awakened in the old man, in the elder, by my talk. What seemed to unite the reactions to my lectures in New Zealand in 1984 and now in 2014 was the fact that on both occasions I had talked about the fact that my education in, into English included being beaten, if God speaking a Koyo, my language, in any part of the school grounds. A similar thread, violence against native languages, runs through the spread of English in Ireland, Scotland, Wales, and America among native peoples. In Wales, for instance, those that spoke Welsh in the school compound were made to stand in front of the class with a placard, Welsh not, hanging for their necks, again humiliating a people because of their own language. In his book, My People, the Sioux, the Sioux, the author, who is a Native American, Luther Standing Bear, dramatizes this in the education of Native Americans. The book tells of his experience as among the first Native American children to attend school, a boarding school, to learn to speak, read, and write English at Carlisle Indian School in Pennsylvania. Uh, excuse me. Uh, I'm sweating at the idea of being thrashed. <laughs> it brings memories, so sweat comes out. <laughs> uh, actually, I can tell you a story about this. I was giving this kind of talk in parents in uh, Penn State in uh, USA, and uh, when I talked about Carlisle School, in a school at Penn, I was forgetting that I was in Penn State, and my audience erupted, saying, it is here, it's here, you know, it's, it's right? Because the school is still there, but of course in a different form. Huh? Uh, the boarding school, was opened in 1879, the very first such school for Native Americans, which became the model for others to follow. On entering a classroom a few days after their arrival, Luther and fellow students found a lot of marks on the blackboard. Actually, there were English names, and each student had to pick one, just point at any number, and that would become his name. The, the teacher would take that piece of, a piece of white paper, write the name, point the dot on it, then cut off a length of tape and sew it on the back of the boy's shirt. Soon, they had all names of white men sewed on their backs. So violence against use of their own language is followed. Now, the person who started school was a military guy called Richard Pratt. And in 1892, Richard, Captain Richard Pratt, uh, the founder of Carlisle, articulated 
the vision that had guided him in founding a school. And, he, and his vision was very simple. Kill the Indian in him and save the man. Kill the Indian in him and save the man. The idea of killing the native to save them through their reincarnation as new colonial language speaking beings had been stated more eloquently by one Macaulay in his policy for education in colonial India when India was owned or rather owned by England. When in the famous 1834 minutes on Indian education, he advocated English as a medium of education to replace Sanskrit and Persian in order to create a class of people, Indian in blood and color, but otherwise English in mentality and everything else. In other words, a linguistically westernized middleman would automatically carry out the intent of the ruler to the masses of those ruled. They were very clear about what language was meant to do to people of India. Pierre Fonsin was a founder of Alliance French. So you know the French teachings broad language, you know, Alliance Francais. And he said exactly the same thing for French. I found this actual quotation in uh, Walter Rodney's book, How Europe and a Developed Africa. I said, so I quote, so I'm repeat the words quoted by Walter Rodney, that according to him, it was necessary to attach the colonies the metropole by a very solid psychological bond against the day when their progressive emancipation ends presumably with independence, that they be and they remain French in language, thought, and spirit. Um, we shall have in discussion, we'll talk about the consequences of this, because it has very practical consequences. It's not just, it doesn't remain in the realm of thought, it has actually very severe uh, consequences on policy, even economic policy of a country. But let me go back to English. Even the 18th century struggles for standardization of English had an imperial intent. According to Adam R. Beach, B E A C H, standardized English would become the building block of a metaphysical empire, an empire of language and literature that would outlive the actual physical empire. Of course, metaphysical empires then create colonies of the mind, like mental satellites that permanently orbit around the imperial sun at the center, right? The colony of the mind prevents meaningful or nationally empowering innovations in education, in particular, the language of education in the literal sense of verbal systems and the symbolic in the sense of all the non-verbal means used to educate. But the pattern emerging in the context of the colonized and colonized victor and vanquished, may actually uh, be part of education system in any 
structures or inequality. Education may become a process of mystifying knowledge. Education and knowledge are two entities, but education actually can become a mystifying, a way of mystifying knowledge and its acquisition, or rather what you might call the cognitive process, the process of knowing. Here, for the sake of clarity, I have to make a distinction between education on one hand and knowledge on the other. Knowledge is, first of all, comes the word know, and it means no more than we just know, right? Uh, knowledge, therefore, is a question of continuously adding to what we already know. A system of from here to there, there to here, in a dialectical play of mutual impact and illumination. So the normal cognitive process always starts from the known to, un to the unknown. But every new step makes the unknown known and therefore adds to what is already known. The new known enriches the already known and so on in a continuous journey of making connections. Knowledge of the world begins where one is, and such knowledge is power. When you can connect from where you are from your base to anywhere, to any point in the globe, it's power. It's very powerful, right? Because you can connect, you can go there and come home. I was telling the story, because I like to start telling stories a little bit, let me get all the script. Um, because I like observing, I don't want to at the airports, another place where they are crowd. I like watching little children, their mothers, and, or with their elders, or whatever. And you know, children, when they, get, they never get really bored, because they also try to find something to do, like running away from their parents, and hiding, Run! and then hiding. You know, but they always look back quickly to note where their parents are. The more they are sure of where their parents are, the more <laughs> they're going to come in hiding, in running away, right? Should they actually look back and they don't find their parents, what do they do? They scream. Yeah? They feel lost because they've lost connection with the base, so to speak, right? So their capacity to move farthest and even among the crowds and so on is actually dependent very much on their continually being able to relate to the base, right? Disconnect that. Oh, my God. Right? So knowledge of the world begins where one is, and such knowledge is power. But education is really, on the other hand, a mode of conditioning a person to make them fit into and function in any given society. Education, such education may involve actually may involve transference of knowledge, but it is conditioned knowledge branded by the world outlook of the educator and the education system. In a context of extremes of wealth and power in any society, education as knowledge transfer can never ever be neutral and especially in the context of dominating and dominated. This is clearer, probably, if you get, you know, in the situation of the colonized and colonized. 
The colonial process was always a negation of the normal cognitive process of from here to there. It's looking the other way around. From there, somewhere, somewhere in the end to here. Okay. Europe, as I remember right in my own education, its names, its geography, its history, knowledge was always seen as a starting point of the education journey of the colonized. In short, colonization in the area of education was all predicted on, predicted on the negation of the colonial space or the colonized space as a starting point of knowledge. So it even makes you like, like I don't want, we can go into this, you know, like the body, our body is a starting point of everything. Yeah? You know, that's because we know our body best. But the colonial education can make your own body a problem to yourself. <laughs> so you begin to question your own body, and it's your own body, right? Right. Mm. So, uh, in the area of languages, for reasons, it meant a negation of people's languages as valid sources of knowledge and intellectual and artistic inquiry. In the end, actually, it creates a very, col very colonized elite at um, Macaulay and the Pratt we are talking about. Mm. This is the mentality of the outsider looking in. A mental attitude that persists in the post-colonial era. And quite frankly, it's simple. If, <laughs> if you know a language, which is part of your education, which is not known by the majority of the people, you can only relate to them as an outsider would actually, sometimes even needing an interpreter, yeah? And we see it, but in the case of Africa, in a way the post-colonial elite want to erase their names, the skin color or the body sometimes, and most important, well, or equally important, run away from their languages. Sometimes in, in Kenya I find it very fascinating. So now you find there's parents who, are, who don't want their, to hear their children speaking. They're very proud when their children don't understand. And they'll display it to visitors. And they say, oh, our children, oh, you know. And they can say, oh, ah, you know, these children, I don't know what we're going to do about They don't know our language. But they are proud. They're not saying that in sorrow. It's a kind of pride that they don't understand us. All right? Um, and they see this as something positive, okay? Uh, uh, we sometimes, uh, we see it in, again in Africa, in, uh, yeah, they want to erase their names, the skin color of the body sometimes, their languages. They dress, distrust their bodies, their geography, their culture and history as valid starting point in their journey into the world. We see it in the continuous intellectual and emotional habit of post-colonial elites and even governments of looking to Europe and the West for validation. It's not that they can be the most, the brightest, you know, actually in terms of, but that, in, that unsureness about their base, you know, becomes a problem. Like that child, when she loses, they lose contact with their parents, okay? So they're always looking for validation elsewhere. So sometimes we don't trust national initiatives in knowledge, in inventions even, unless it earns a measure of approving admiration of the West. I mean, the case of my being put in prison for writing in my own language by an African government was, <laughs> you can, it's comical, 
in one respect. Yeah? Except it's not very nice to be in prison. <laughs> Sometimes we always hear applauses of pride and approval for knowledge obtained from the imperial and metropolis, but very muted applause for knowledge obtained in national institutions. And then some of our institutions actually become copies of those abroad. And in my view, there's no originality, originality in copying, because copying, even the best copy, is still a copy. But when you start from yourself, it's, it's always something new, because it, when from your own experience, you interact with that experiences, something new is born, right? It, so we, you, you, he and I can have the same experience of something external to us, but since we also have our own individual experiences, uh, that interaction from our own base, what his base and my base, experiencing the third element, it will, we shall be adding something to that interaction, right? Right, because his experience of history and my experience of history is really unique, and each one of us, their own actual individual experience of social surroundings actually is unique. Yeah. So when they bring that uniqueness in, to interact with the new and so on, you actually create something uh, new. In short, lack of roots in one starting base creates a state of permanent uncertainty about one's abilities, achievements, even. It even warps one's dreams and ambitions, like the desire to identify with that which is farthest removed from self. Decolonizing has to mean the negation of the negation of the colonial process. Knowledge, I will repeat, starts where and wherever we are. Our languages are valid sources of knowledge. We can all reach the stars, but we don't have to first migrate to other countries in order to reach the star, you know. Yeah, we can actually reach for the stars from wherever we are. And if someone tells you, no, 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 come here, you can, you can, you can only catch the star from where I stand. Tell him, oh, okay, well, you come here, you cannot. I mean, <laughs> you have to counter it, right? Because we can reach stars from wherever oh, we stand, okay? So our languages, I repeat, are valid sources of knowledge. We can all reach the stars or hope to reach the stars but we don't have to fast migrate to other places, in our case to Europe, physically or metaphorically, in order to reach the stars. In the case of languages, the problem in any one country or the world is not the existence of many languages and cultures and even religions but their relationship in terms of hierarchy. The view that my culture, my religion is of higher order than yours. In terms of religion, for instance, the statement that my God is more of a God than your God is very ungodly. <laughs> uh, in terms of languages, this view leads some people to see their own languages as inherently more of languages than other languages. Sometimes I call this hierarchy, linguistic feudalism. And my view is, and this is view of, I think UNESCO, I was over in Japan, that all languages be 
and small have actually a lot to contribute to our common humanity. If freed from linguistic feudalism, education policies should be devised on the basis that all languages are treasuries of beauty and possibility. They have something to give to each other if their relationship is that of the give and take of a network. Even if one of the languages should emerge as a language of communication across the many languages, it should not be on the basis of its assumed inherent nationness or globality, but on the basis of need and necessity. And even then, it should not grow on the graveyard of other languages. You know, which actually, if you remember the beatings, the, the violence, you can see it doesn't make sense. These days you can go to university three, four, five years and learn many languages, for instance. But nobody beats you, violence, against the language you come with to the college. Okay? So this means that you must puppet violence against a one's own mother tongue in order to learn a foreign language is, you can see, it's doing something far beyond the question of language acquisition. It's something else. Because there's no, there's no necessary connection between violence against your own language in order to know another language. You know, so why should I go through violence? in order, against my own language, in order to acquire somebody else's, you know, uh, yeah. So I always think that maybe the best slogan to have is one of network, not hierarchy. Uh, but this, of course, has other problems, you know, which I don't want to go into right now because we can go into it through and count the questions, because the whole thing has to do with what I like to call imperial reason or imperial logic, which actually governs most of our societies today. And it's quite simple. We, people think that, uh, and today for the people measure, oh, I can't, oh, oh, it's very progressed. Ah, they have many millionaires. You know, but a billionaire, 10 billionaires and 10 billion poor, <laughs> right? Uh, imperial logic actually means that if I can only be healthy by passing my leprosy or my illness to others, my health is dependent on others being, you know, without health or without access to health, right? So the question of language is seeing it covers many other areas I don't want to go into right now. But personally, I don't believe in linguistic and cultural self-isolation. I want to connect to the world, but who from wherever I am. And I believe that the end of education is knowledge that empowers, that shows our real connections to the world. But from our base. From our base, we explore the world. From the world, we bring back that which enriches and strengthens our base. I'm saddened by the fact that the nations of the earth have not yet signed on to the important statement on languages in the Universal Declaration of Linguistic Rights, the Barcelona Declaration. The acceptance and support of language diversity within nations and the world is necessary for achieving or for what I once called moving the center, moving the center from its current imperial location to its real place among ordinary peoples of the earth. The languages that these communities speak and use, 
which are the also the sites of their culture and knowledge of ecology accumulated over the years should be the building block of a shared human culture, not the other way, not, you know, it doesn't matter, uh, but rather the other way around. In other words, a global human culture should be rooted in the particularities of all these languages, however small, and the cultures and the knowledges that they carry, right? And we should start with the acceptance of the obvious that there is no language which is more of a language than any other language. Monolingualism is the carbon monoxide of culture. Multilingualism is the oxygen. But it has to be a multilingualism that begins with the language of one's culture as a base. In other words, if you know all the languages of the world, but abandon your mother tongue or the language of your culture, that actually is enslavement. But if you know the language of your culture and add all the other languages of the world to it, that is empowerment. And what we really want, at least I hope this is what we all want, is really the empowerment of all world peoples. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias por esta apasionante eh, lliçó. En el, el, el libro Descolonizar la Mente comienza con una declaración de l'autor que dice aquel libro Descolonizar la Mente es el meu comiat a l'anglès com como vehículo de cap de las nuevas obras. Dar endavant escriure escribiré siempre en Kikuyu y Swahili. Y aquel libro mostra cómo desde el començament, desde aquellos debates de los años 60 a Maquerere, la seva obra se ha construido en debat amb els escritores que han optado por la lengua inglesa y que, fins i tot defensen que incorporan, como Chinua Achebe, por ejemplo, que defensen que incorporan desde la lengua inglesa paraules de la seva propia eh, tradición eh, lingüística están transformando el inglés y están apropiando el inglés. ¿Quién ha estado el seu debate amb aquests autors? ¿Qué es, qué es el que usted el, el responde? Y que porque aquest debate ha acompañado toda la seva obra desde el comenzamiento. Yeah. Oh, yes, I would admit, what actually happens is very, very interesting. That sometimes the same language in qualities, some of them create an intellectual elite that some believe that <laughs> They own the language of colonization more than they own theirs. Mm -hmm. right? And they are coming with all ways of saying, oh, but I can turn English to become my own. Eh? I can smuggle a few African words all into English and make it my own, right? What they are really saying is no more and they are working within the imperial, <laughs> law, imperial uh, boundaries of English. What they are doing is expanding, contributing to expansion and capacities of the dominant language. Now, what's very interesting is that, I don't want to go into history too much, but I find the Irish case very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay, let me just say briefly, just very, very quickly. See, the Ireland actually was the first English colony because English settlers started.
started settling in England, uh, in Ireland. And, um, but Irish language at that time was more powerful than English. They had better and more and deeper tradition of the written word. And the settlers, English settlers, when they are, would naturally gravitate towards Irish. So those guys in London uh, would pass laws. You know. One of the earliest I know actually is called the Treaty of Kelkin in 1966. Mm -hmm. And it was actually forbade, literally the law, for bidding, forbidding English settlers in Ireland to speak Irish and forbidding Irish, any Irish near the English settlement who spoke uh, Irish would be punished very severe. And this goes on and on and on and on. Um, one of the most celebrated of Irish poets, or English poets called Edmund Spencer, who wrote at the same time as Shakespeare. And he wrote, in 1598, he publishes a book called A View of Ireland at the, at the present time. And it's very interesting, the conversation that takes place between a visiting English lord and, and um, the settler English. And they're saying, how come we have not managed to tame the Irish? What can we do? And actually the book, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. And they, actually they come up with this scheme, you say, shall use, erase their naming system and their language. You can do that, they'll forget who they are. Anyway, I don't go into the long history of Irish history to England. All I know is that towards the 19th century and towards the, you get now Irish writers who write in English coming to assume the identity of Irish literature. And the same arguments I've heard among Irish writers, particularly Yeats and even James Joyce, where they say they can smuggle Irish words and the rhythms into English to make it their own, right? So I hear the same thing sometimes among African mm -hmm. writers. Mm -hmm. No, wait a minute. It's not English language or French that needs others to come from the periphery or whatever to enrich it. It's the other way around. It's the language from which you come that needs me mm -hmm. and the educated elite from that language community. It's their own language needs them more than English needs them to go and create a little branch of English within the English orbit and so on, you know. Uh, so, although we tried, we have, went through this journey, including myself, so I'm not, I, don't, I don't have a holier-than-now attitude. I did the same thing. You write in English, but if you can put a few African words and African proverbs, it will make, remind people that you are writing in, or that your characters are really Africans, that they are speaking African language, although you see their speech in English. When I started writing in Ikeo, the liberation was so much, I didn't have to go through that <laughs> business of trying to prove that there are African characters. Mm -hmm. Because if you want to know, you read Ikeo. Mm -hmm. Just like I read other works in translation, and it's fine for me. And also one thing that you subraya el seu llibre Somnis en temps de guerra, aquest records d'infantesa, en Gugi explica que eh, a les nits, cada nit hi havia llarga estona de relats, de històries que s'explicaven, però que l'endemà al matí ningú se'n recordava, entre els infants, de com explicar aquelles històries que la nit havien estat tan viscudes, amb una excepció, que és la seva germana Vàvia, una germana que va patir la desgràcia, que la va tocar un llamp, i a causa del llamp va quedar cega i impedida de caminar. 
però a les nits escoltava les històries i durant el dia les sabia reproduir encara amb més vivesa, encara amb més vitalitat, que no com les havien escoltat la nit abans. I en Cuqui diu que a través d'aquesta germana, aquesta tradició oral de la llengua Kikuyu i de la seva pròpia literatura li ha arribat. De manera que l'opció pel Kikuyu l'entronca amb aquesta tradició oral africana. Sí, ella era increïble. In so many ways, my sister, because as he said, she was physically challenged in many ways, could not see. But for some reason, and she couldn't walk, she had to walk, walk on. Uh, so she could not move beyond the compound of our house. Or my, well, she was my half sister. And, but it's as if her ears this capacity to capture sounds far away. So her imagination, or whatever it was, became her way of connecting with the world. Even as, in the hymns sung in churches, she knew them. So when you forgot what verse, the song, hymn, they came to her. So she could reproduce everything. She was really amazing in so many ways. And I'm always very grateful. She has passed on now, but I'm always very grateful to her memory. Potser el que tenim a fer és obrir, si hi hagués algunes preguntes, tenim deu minuts encara, per si algú volgués adreçar alguna pregunta a en Gugui Betiongo. Allà al fons vaig crear una mà. Si podeu passar el micròfon, a l'última fila. I hope I can explain myself well in English. Um, in the recent years, integration policies in the European Union are uh, like a legal frame uh, to Im impose racist policies. One of the things that are, are being like, asked to migrant people is to learn the language. Like for example, recently in the context of England, Cameron uh, said that uh, migrants that didn't uh, learn the language would be deported. Or, for example, in Holland recently, uh, migrants were being imposed uh, fines if they didn't go through integration tests uh, and learn the language. Um, this is something that happens also in the context of Catalonia, in the sense that uh, in order to get your residency permit... Però pregunta-li coses que tinc a veure amb la seva ponència amb les llengües africanes. No, 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 it has to do with that. Because African people are being imposed Catalan language in Barcelona context, no? So, in this context, Catalan is being imposed in the sense that you have to go through a test, an interview of Catalan in order to get your residency permit. Mostly this happens uh, to migrants that have been illegalized for a long time. Not, for example, in my case, I'm married with a Spanish, so it's, it's not a, a problem for them. Um, so if you have any commentary in how uh, language is being used in a racist way within the European borders, and also uh, if you have any commentary in this complex case like Catalonia, that in the aim of defending a language, they are imposing it to people who have a much more vulnerable situation and basically telling you, okay, if you don't learn the language, then uh, you will have to be deported or Gracias. be detained in an immigrant detention center or whatever. Perdó, és que m'he oblidat de, de dir que, sisplau, fossin intervencions breus. Tinc tres paraules, escoltarem les tres eh, preguntes i després en Gugui contestarà a tots. Allà i aquí. Thank you. I would like to uh, ask about the experience of theater, the Camerito uh, Cultural Center. For what I know, I am a theater practitioner myself. That was an extraordinary experience with uh, I will marry when I want and I think uh, uh, Devil on the Cross. Um, I know that one of these plays was going to the National Theatre of Kenya, but it was banned. 
And in spite of that, thousands of people saw the play. Could you please tell us how was that? Thank you. Sorry, my English is terrible. Vostè creu que en una societat on som invisibilitzats no existim i no ens consideren? El seu llibre pot arribar a algú? Ok, let me start with the last question. First of all, by the way, we are actually very visible. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> no, let, me t let me tell you why. Let me, no, let me just say. When I go, when I'm walking, sort of, you know, I was in Vienna the other day, and I found myself noting each and every black person I met. And I wanted to say, you know, you kind of want to say hi. Because... <laughs> <laughs> because they are, they are so few, <laughs> right? Well, at least the ones I met, anyway. So, um, and um, especially if you are a black person, believe me, we are very visible. People may not want to see us, but they. <laughs> yeah. But seriously, uh, that I, each place, of course, has its own complexities and so on. Right. But wherever we are, we have to make a distinction between the, even in our own countries, the language of power. And for survival, and this also connects to the other question, for survival, one has to master the language of power. Survival alone dictates that we do that. But that does not or should not necessarily mean abandonment of their own language. In fact, wherever we are, we can use our languages as strength, okay? Because even if we are a small family, we can have power in being rooted on mastering our own language and culture, however, and also knowing in course also their own language. Like, ah, I know my language, but you, and I know yours, but you don't know mine, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. So, um, when I'm in the States, for instance, our languages are very, very important. We must fight for them. But you have also, and, and, and I say this, don't take your language, even the so-called broken, like many African-American people and Caribbean people and so on have developed new language systems. And sometimes people, are, those language systems are described as broken in English. And I say, no, no, wait a minute. Your language is not a lower rung on the ladder to an English heaven, right? Mm. There's no such a thing that is a lower form. Your language is a different system of communication, and it's fine. It's got its own logic and everything else. But in addition to that language, also, please, for as long as there's a language of power, you have to also master it for survival and so on. Find ways of maneuvering through that. Yeah. Uh, so. To make us more visible or invisibility as strength, we have to connect with each other. And more important, also connect with our own languages. And I repeat, not so as to live in self isolation. You root yourself in your language and then connect, right? It is so much power in that. Even it liberates one in the sense that when you do that, you even begin to appreciate mm -hmm. the other language better in a more meaningful 
not in a slave master relationship, but as equals when you learn from an equal, okay? Uh, at least this is what I found in my own relation to English and English literature. The other question you raised over there, I can't answer directly, but I can only say this. Europe, two things are happening actually in the world today. First, historically, people of Europe should know that Europe as a continent has occupied more of other people's lands than any other continent, right? Yeah. Historically, uh, because the whole of America, European people's occupying Native American lands, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, uh, South Africa a little bit, and so on. So historically, it's never the other way around. Uh, it's not the people of Asia so far uh, who occupy in large quantities European land is the other way around. For me to remember that. The second thing we have to remember is when we talk of, for instance, globalization, people are really talking about the ability of finance capital to move across borders without state intervention. They're talking about freedom. Give finance capital the globe for a theater, right? Because with that, the opposite is also happening. You create barriers to the movement of labor. You put walls to the movement of labor. You say, labor, stay wherever you are. We shall find you, right? So I find it very interesting at the same time as people are saying, oh, there must be no barriers to the movement of capital, and uh, they are saying, but labor cannot move from one country to another, okay? Uh, very, and they are building walls or creating a, a kind of nationalism where they see the immigrants as a problem. They don't want to look at, it, at the structures of inequalities in their own society, in our own society, it's easier to see an immigrant as a problem. By the way, even in 16th century England, there's one time when Queen Elizabeth I thought the unemployment in England in 16th century had to do with a few black people who were there in 16th century, right? <laughs> <laughs> And she was asking for the expulsion <laughs> from England. Thank you. I'm going to end here. I want to thank you from all of the Centre of Cultura Contemporánea for having invited in Gugi, the Pen Català and the President Carmarenas for having contributed to the trip. The Raig Verd and the editor Laura Huerga for disposar a partir d'avui, acaba d'arribar a les llibreries de descolonitzar la ment i desplaçar el centre, a De Bolsillo també, perquè ens acosta les novel·les d'en Gugi Wationgo, els intèrprets per la seva magnífica feina d'aquest vespre, i en Gugi, molt cordialment, el fet que hagi vingut fins a nosaltres i hagi volgut compartir aquesta feina. Gràcies.